uh, from the Western Island, what I would call Australia. Um, so I speak with an accent. So some will pick it up. Um, and that's, that's my presentation. What makes for a world-class education for Aboriginal students from rural communities? Now, I put an asterisk next to the word Aboriginal there for two reasons. Uh, one reason is I use the word Aboriginal interchangeably with Indigenous, as we do in our country. And the other reason uh, will become apparent, hopefully, throughout the presentation. And then the sub there. What do we want to hear and what do the data tell us? So, just for the uh, mundane stuff, it's an Australian Research Council funded uh, research project. We went into six schools, did interviews, so this is the qualitative component I'm reporting on. Uh, we did interviews of parents, teachers, students, school assistants, all that, uh, in two urban, two rural and two remote schools, where there was a high, at least 50% um, of the school population were Australian Indigenous. Um, comment I'd like to make from the beginning, we're much alike even if it does not always look that way. Now, that diagram means nothing but it will later on. Okay. It's often a theme throughout all my talks whenever I'm talking about anything indigenous, where we're much more alike, okay, the indigenous and non-indigenous, we're much more alike than they appear. Here's what one of the school chaplains said um, about the school he worked at. We're all in it together, we help each other out, we're about the whole person, we're about the whole community. It's about being here to help the whole community. So, this theme of community in rural settings come out time and time again, okay, which is a lot different to urban schools, where they still um, the schools still have a, a community focus and that sort of thing. But at, in the rural settings, it's it's even more pronounced and even more necessary. Yeah. Um, and when we say um, successful. For Indigenous kids, we mean academically and non-academically. So Indigenous kids who are performing well, getting good grades, and are socially well adjusted. And again, this uh, theme of community. When teachers apply for a job at our school, they are really applying for a job in the community. Okay. The principal also told me my staff are on duty 24-7. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the teachers told me, yes, she needs that. Um, I didn't go into detail, but I can tell by the tone of their voice, they had experienced um, the consequences of um, not behaving appropriately in the community. Um, so in these small rural communities, you know, the teacher is obviously a key person, and you're on display you know, all the time. So it, it has its pluses and minuses. And if you work with it, the teachers tell me it's fantastic. Having some connections with Community is desirable for an urban-based school, as I just said, but for rural schools, it is crucial and a must. Okay. So what works well in these, uh, in these rural schools? Schools must be responsive to the community dynamics. Okay. So the local needs, so is it low SES, is it cold climate, whatever, schools need to be responsive to that. School, pro school programs should reflect community values and events. Um, so sports, local indigenous culture, uh, if that's prominent, well then that should be reflected and incorporated in the school. Crucial one, early interventions. Okay, now in rural schools, um, much like New Zealand I've learned, you can be, if you're living in a rural community, to get to see a specialist, a speech pathologist or something, can mean a four, five, six hour drive, okay? And most people don't have that luxury to be able to do it. And sometimes the speech pathologist, um, you know, has a once or a fortnight, once a month visit to a school, which means schools are having to do a lot of work, a lot more work, early intervention uh, with the younger grades um, than what they would in urban settings. And as Tom was saying in his talk before, with literacy, they start out behind and they stay behind throughout the trajectory of school life, which is why in rural schools it is so crucial to intervene early. Um, and it, it's interesting, I had one teacher tell me, and this certainly is similar to my experience uh, as a student, teachers these days in remote, rural communities are having to be teacher, social worker, 
psychologist, and very importantly, a nurse. Um, and that, that's just part of the package of, of working in a rural school in Australia. So they need to intervene early, nip these things in the bud. Um, I was at one school which uh, was remote just a few weeks ago. And if you think of a, a continuum, you've got urban, rural, and remote. There's you know, a common thread that runs through all, I'm focusing on the rural. Um, the remote, it's a bit different, but there are some similarities. And I forget what I was going to say now about this uh, remote school. I've got a, um, oh, oh, yes. Remote. Remote. Sorry? How remote are they? Um, very remote, where you've got to get to them by plane. Um, or, or one hour in a barge, yeah. one and a half hours in a barge across the water. Um, at this particular school, because they had invested, and they continued to invest so much in the um, younger years, they see that it is tripping up, and they said, you know, that grade twos know a bit more than the grade threes. Grade fives know a bit more than the grade six because of um, the, the recent um, waiting towards the younger years. Stability of staff is highly desirable. By stability, I mean low turnover, although it is good to have staff who are stable <laughs> mentally. But in this context, especially in rural schools, um, when you have, and you can understand it's going to be hard, um, Teachers, you know, they go to these places, they do one or two years, and understandably, they want to move on. They want to get back to the city. And it does make it hard for these rural schools. But when I've spoken to them, one of the, the, the ones that are doing well, one of the factors they mentioned is they said, we've had a low turnover of staff. And that all has all sorts of advantages. As one teacher was telling me, um, when you have a kid and you, you know, taught his brother three years ago, that family know you, there's a... You know, Relationship there, um, and you know, it's all positives. Greater engagement both inside and outside of the school between staff and students and their families. The principal was telling me, you know, if you've got a, a picture of your family or the, the dog, share it with the kids. They, he said they love that sort of thing. They love to know about you. And also, you're walking down the street, you cannot help but bump into these kids, and that's just part of life. So you, a little bit different um, in the urban settings where you. Um, you know, you might live 10 kilometres from the school, a small chance you're going to pop into the street, whereas in these rural communities, that's what's happening all the time. So the dynamic changes, and you need to adjust accordingly. Inclusiveness, all these successful schools I um, interviewed, they said inclusiveness was part of their, their ethos there. And now, that, that doesn't mean to say that, um, oh, Indigenous kids are so disadvantaged and backwards that you need an inclusive uh, approach. These schools were just saying, you know, that's our approach with anyone. Um, and so, you know, we're taking disabled people, able people, at the, the whole lot. Whole of child approach, coming back to what I said before, the teachers are having to take on that role of social worker, nurse. Um, it's more extreme in the remote schools where I had a principal, I said, you know, what's the most important thing up here? And he said, health is everything. When you've got kids with school sores and having days and weeks off school and you know, all that sort of thing, um, it, it really hinders the, um, the learning of children. What I'm saying is probably not much of a surprise to many of you. Okay. Uh, some of the challenges for working <coughs> in a... a rural area, obtaining and retaining quality teachers can be very challenging. Um, I had one principal tell me, and I said, you know, what are some of the problems? And, she's, and there are other teachers there, and the principal said, look, okay, I'll say it, given that no one else wants to say it, I will say it. In this particular community, the high school wasn't that great a high school, which means if you're a teacher who's had a you know, few years experience, which are generally the better teachers in general, and she said she wants the older teachers because they're better, it's hard to keep them because if that teacher does not want their kid going to that high school, the only choice is to leave or send them off to boarding school. Um, so it's better for, for teachers without children, but then again, generally speaking, 
you get the younger teachers, and this principal is happy to mentor them, but it's good to have a core of experienced teachers, which generally means teachers who have got kids who are of a high school age. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Striking the balance between school responsibility and parental responsibility. Okay, so I said these days teachers in these places have to be everything. What are parents supposed to be doing? Okay. Sometimes the parent, for whatever reason, the parents lack those skills of applying first aid, hygiene, um, you know, all that sort of thing. And what do you do? If you're, you know, you're a school principal, you're a school teacher, you can't let the kids suffer. Uh, another one, a lot of these places have breakfast programs. Okay? And that sounds fine. You think, okay, the kids are getting breakfast, they're learning, you've got to have a full stomach. Yeah, that's fine. Problem is, it sets a precedent. Parents no longer have to, and not being judgmental, but it is an issue you, you have to deal with. You know, these parents need to be empowered. And where do you draw that line? Between what the school and we know well, it's, it's in my my observations it's been that this this line it's shifting more and more each year where parents are having to be more responsible legally responsible uh, for a whole host of things which in my generation as a kid the parents took care of manners my parents taught me manners the teachers taught me massive English these days teachers are having to teach uh, manners. Schools could benefit from more school-based health staff. So, as I said, that principal in the remote setting who said health is everything. When it comes to hearing health, speech pathology, uh, learning about healthy body, all that sort of thing, these places could benefit from it a lot more because it does hinder and slow down the learning. School can sometimes be the only safe space for the children. So, often with Indigenous people, indigenous families, I've got to be careful saying this, you, have, you can have a lot of violence, tension in the home and the communities, the kids witness this, it upsets them, they come to school, it's their only safe space. Parents can sometimes be reluctant to come into the school due to their own personal bad past experience. They may not have any school in themselves, um, or if they did, it was, you know, their only memory of it was racism. Uh, where, you know, back in the you know, 70s, there was a lot of racism um, towards Indigenous kids, so they stay away from the school. One innovative principal told me what she did is she has the parent-teacher interviews and that sort of meetings up at the school pool. It's neutral, not the school pool, the, the community pool. It's neutral ground. So the parents will come there, they don't, they don't think of it as being on the school grounds. However, now this, this presentation is, um, you saw the title, but it is, it is a bit of a Trojan horse. So I'm bringing in another message. Um, Tom, you've come just for the, the meeting bit. The meeting bit. Um, I'll just say, um, my presentation is a bit of a Trojan horse for this message which I'm going to bring in now. Okay, so, yeah, people want to know, yeah, but what is it that Aboriginal students really need? Because I've just, so far, uh, my presentation has been, I've identified the um, different factors for success and challenges, and th that generally often applies to Indigenous and non-Indigenous children in rural communities. And so people want to know, okay, that, that's fine, but tell me about the Indigenous kids, what's different for them, what do you do for them, how do you handle them? Now before I talk about that, I just need to take a little detour. We need to start seeing things differently. We've been trained to see things in a certain way, especially with Indigenous affairs. Okay? Now you look there, most people will see the horse. Can you see the frog? I'll just yeah. turn it. Yeah. Now I've turned it because I don't want you all sitting there going <laughs> like that. You'll have a sore neck. So the picture hasn't changed, but our perspective. Yes, exactly. Our perspective. And that's what I'm suggesting. We just need to change our perspective on things. Now, I'm going to, um, this is a conference about research, obviously. We talk about research and formal research-based, evidence-based 
and all that sort of thing. And I do believe, I'm not, I'm not sure passion the problem. And I'm going to raise something which, this is a question, I, a point I put to you last time we met in Melbourne. I believe in research as well. However, based on my experience in academia, I have seen some research which um, is very ordinary or sub substandard uh, and even sometimes very bad. But it gets part, it gets generated from a university. It gets published in a peer-reviewed journal. How could you ever question something that's in a peer-reviewed journal? Um, and it becomes gospel. Yeah, and I've seen what goes on behind the scenes with some of that research. I think, well, you know, it's not quite like that. Um, and again, this is a detour within the detour, I guess. In academia these days, there is enormous pressure to get published. And you don't get published by uh, reinventing the wheel or um, stating the things we know. You get published for presenting new things. <laughs> um, you, you know, we've got to reject the null hypothesis and um, come up with this new thing. So, because research is a human endeavour, the beliefs, the assumptions and knowledge of the researcher influence the results. This influence permeates the research process, starting with which research questions are deemed worthy of exploration and which are not, through the construction of research tools, interview question scale construction, and into specification of causative agents and appropriate interventions. So, it's very easy, uh, if I just stick with Indigenous research for a moment, you can ask, you can come up with these questionnaires about culture. How important to you is, it, is your culture? It, does your teacher pay enough attention to your culture? And these are often questions which a kid has never ever thought of. But when you present it to them, they start to think, oh, actually, yeah, yeah. I noticed that, you know, or whatever. And you get them thinking things that they've never thought of, which haven't been a barrier, and suddenly they can become a barrier. So research, we need to be careful conducting research and we need to be careful as consumers of research. But again, I, I'm all for um, research. Now, one of the things that I found, and I didn't go looking for this, um, I, I tried to apply this to myself, I did not go in with loaded questionnaires or anything. And here's what happened at one school. I went there, I was, you know, the, I met the principal, he just took me for a quick tour, and the first person we met was the guy who was the scripture teacher, and he was also the groundsman. So he had a dual, dual role, it was quite a strange uh, multi-task role in this school. It's a rural school. And, like I said, I was there for five minutes, this groundsman didn't know anything about me, and this is the dialogue that took place. So when he says our kids, he means the indigenous and non-indigenous kids. Um, and certainly there are some differences to be considered, and I will get to that shortly. But I want to make this point about the commonalities. Um, because I believe if you are going to address the differences between indigenous and non-indigenous kids, or the differences between male and female, or the differences between a Holden and a Ford car, you start with the commonalities. You make sure you understand the commonalities, you then move to the differences if they are there. You don't make them if they're not there, if they're there and they're relevant. You then deal with them. Um, Deputy Principal, I don't. I asked. I put the question to her. Why is the school doing so well with Indigenous kids? Without thinking, I don't think we do work so well for Indigenous kids. I think we work well for our kids. She just saw them as our kids, Indigenous, non-Indigenous. Um, and this was, again, a school which had more than 50% Indigenous kids. 50% or more. One teacher, there's no such thing as black kids or white kids. They're just our kids. And everyone comes under that umbrella. Um, now that brings me to a, a quote from a favourite philosopher of mine, Anthony DeMello. We're all the same. You've got a thin veneer of culture that's different, but deep down we're all the same. Hatred is the same, the conflict is the same, the guilt is the same, the dependence on people's opinions and the emotional dependence on approval are the same. 
it's exactly the same, just scrape off the exterior culture, we're all the same. However, like I said, I, I do not dismiss Aboriginal culture uh, where it's relevant, and there are times when it is relevant. And that is, that's generally, again, a generalisation. Um, it's more likely to be in the remote settings, but certainly in the rural settings, in Australia at least, um, it is good for teachers to be mindful, but again, it should not be the foundational platform on which their teaching takes place. Um, so where it is important, okay, so if you're, if there's a location, that there are significant indigenous artefacts, uh, places, locations there, well then, just like anything else that's in the environment, it makes sense to teach about it. If, uh, so at one school, I was at, it was by the ocean. So therefore, it's not surprising that a lot, a lot of the curriculum was about the ocean, sea life, and it was used, because I mean, that's what the kids were allowed to do. Okay. If there are some significant indigenous paintings um, near the school, well, it makes sense to include them in the curriculum. When a significant proportion of the school population are Aboriginal, where English is a second language, and there is a strong elder presence. Um, so for those things, yes, it's good for teachers to uh, be sensitive, be aware, and if they feel it's necessary, undergo some sort of uh, cross-cultural training. So I'm not dismissing, dismissing it altogether, but I am making the point that far too often a bigger deal is made of the difference between Indigenous and non-Indigenous kids uh, than actually is warranted. So, um, Rex Fire, one of my favourite uh, social scientists, uh, I've put this in, as, again, it's part of that detour, and he's talking about um, the published articles, how few of them are actually useful. Okay? And, uh, you know, there's, it's been encouraging to see that a lot of academics and researchers are coming out saying, look, you know, we get ranked um, impact factors and that, and it's just all garbage. Um, and so the reason why I put that there is I've seen it with, um, in Indigenous education, a lot of journal articles are uh, published, and a lot of it is useless. There's very little use. What I do see happening is that you get published, and then you see people, uh, oh, to use a, a term that I've had so often, and I'm going to start using it, these journal articles are caricatures of Indigenous people. And you then, when it gets pumped out, you then, um, Start, start to see schools and educators play their role and suddenly they'll start to make a big deal of an Indigenous kid's apparent Indigenous culture. And he may be Indigenous on the grounds that his great-great-grandfather is Indigenous. And, oh, you know, we've got to make sure that we're going to have a special plan for you because you're Indigenous. When before it wasn't a problem, and then all of a sudden it becomes, oh, we've got to deal with it. So, difference is fine, but only after dealing with commonalities. Um, now coming back to the, at the beginning, I put that diagram up there, a couple of tables and the word apple, the book there, apple, okay. Uh, that's a quote by an Indigenous scholar in Queensland. Challenges for non-Indigenous people to accept that our traditions and knowledge are not that different from the dominant group's knowledge base. Now why did I put that, that diagram there at the table? Does anyone guess why? The same, same story, but different. That I look at. Yeah. Same story. Or the same, you know, the same picture and word, but a different view. Yeah, you're kind of getting there. Can you be more precise. Um, yeah, no, no. Different size. Oh, yeah, kind of. Different size. Different shape. That's no. Different perspective. Actually, it's. Are you going to say something? No, no, no. Those tabletops, although may not look like it. Are exactly the same. Yeah. Oh, is that the same? Yeah. Tabletops are. <laughs> yes, you could get a copy of this presentation, you could cut out a tabletop and it will fit exactly <laughs> on top. But it doesn't look the same, does it? No. 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 Uh, and I'm willing to take bets on it. They are, they are congruent, the tabletops. 
It's I'm because of the angle. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, um, some some ways, um, yeah, the orientation just gives it a fatness look. Um, so, I mean, if you if you want to look thinner, get a hook and sort of put it <laughs> like that. Don't put it that way. You'll look fat. Put it that way, you look thin. So, the student at the left-hand side has got a lot of lead room. Where's the student on the right? Oh, you know, that's different. Maybe, no, well, actually, what I'm saying is, Literally, cut that out on a piece of paper, cut it out, and it'll fit exactly on top. But I'm just saying the lead room. Yeah. So the person on the right-hand side actually has a more uncomfortable seating. Oh, could, could do. Yeah, oh, yeah. I wasn't interested about that yeah. aspect. It was just the table top. Mm -hmm. So the point I wanted to make was, yes, it looks different, but they are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So just some concluding comments. And I'll, Got a bit of time for some questions shortly. Okay. Uh, before conducting research on indigenous people, ask is the research really necessary? In Australia, there has been so much research on indigenous education, indigenous people, we have academics just wanting to do more research. I think, well, why don't we look at the research that has been done and see how we can use it, apply it? If it turns out that what's been done in the past is garbage, fine, let's do some new research. But I just feel that in, uh, in 10, 15 years' time, we'll look back on the research has, that has been done and it'll be sitting there. People will be looking for new research. So uh, ask your benefits. Is it the Indigenous people? And clearly they haven't been benefiting in Australia. Or the researcher. And I, I think it's the researcher, again, coming back to this need to... Uh, publish or perish, they are uh, coming up with these sophisticated studies and getting their publications from, and the indigenous people aren't getting any benefit from it. Okay. Um, in Australia there aren't many successful indigenous um, people, businesses, entrepreneurs, students, sports stars, all that sort of thing. Let's study them and see what's worked for them, what have been the fact that the drivers of success are there. And you will find that the factors of success for these indigenous people are the same factors that work for non-indigenous people. Work hard, study, get a good education, have a good moral base, that sort of thing. Um, with the, the whole rural thing which I was, I was talking about before, um, you, you have problems there, okay, once a kid graduates from school, where to? Yeah. Uh, that, that's a topic for another discussion. Um, so that's all I want to say there. Um, I'll just finish up with one of my favourite quotes. And we do have a lot of people telling themselves this lie, oh, Indigenous kids are such a completely different species to the non-Indigenous kids. I was telling someone during the lunch break about another school project I'm involved in, and it's a, um, an elite college, uh, high school for boys, kind of like this school, I guess, um, where they have indigenous, or they have boarders, but some indigenous boys from disadvantaged backgrounds are sponsored. So um, a parent will pay for them, and another parent will mentor the kid. And, in a, and these are boys from rural and remote parts of Australia. And one of the th things that they, um, you know, part of the ethos of that school is we treat all kids the same. We meet them at their needs. So uh, these Indigenous boys, often English is not their first language, so they will give them extra tuition or whatever. But very quickly, the boys, the, not, the Indigenous boys, like the non-Indigenous boys, are very quick to say, I'm a Scots boy and I'm proud to be a Scots boy. They don't see themselves as, oh, I'm an Indigenous kid. It's just... Mm. I'm a Scots boy, just like that white kid. Um, and just the final point, when you take that approach, you're not assimilating the kid, you're not undermining or denying culture, you're just trying to get the best for that kid. So yes, uh, commonalities first, and then look at the differences. That's my presentation, so thank you one all. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, Perhaps there's a point, there's a point um, uh, last year when we first got over there, um, 
we went to see actually there was a hospital in um, near, nearby here where um, Marion Pacifica boys. Where what time? Marion Pacifica boys. Yeah. Are sponsored like mm -hmm. you just said about the Scots School to come yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There is. So, so um, and uh, yeah, some of them are from quite tough backgrounds, but they get like you said, they get a sponsorship, and other people help fund their their schooling, or at least they can live within the area to come here. But some of the critics of that suggested it was set up to boost the rugby team because <laughs> the, the same. <laughs> this girl popped the same criticism, yeah. and that the guy, the coordinator of the program, said, you know. Yes, they're Indigenous boys. Yes, on average they're going to be good at sports, yeah. better at sports, but once they're there at the school, um, they're not pushed into any sport. But shouldn't be surprising. That's, that, that's part of the um, collateral advantage, yeah. Yeah. I guess. I don't know I just made up. <laughs> um, but knowing the school well, that's not their motive, but it's a shame but that's the criticism. Yeah. We went and had dinner with them and they're a great bunch of lovely bunch of boys and they're just grateful to be able to come. To yeah, summer. and uh, the interesting thing, when I interviewed the boys at this particular college, I said, why did you, why did you want to come here? And most of them all very quickly said, because if I'd have stayed where I was, it's not a good place to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if they're going to get that opportunity, and you're going to have critics on the sideline saying you're doing it because you want to have a pretty sports reputation yeah. or you just want to look good or you want to assimilate as let them criticize. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Do you find that um, the students' perspective of themselves is an issue? I know it is within our city schools. So you get kind of like the little groups that they like because they're like the specific groups. Yeah. Um, um, do you find that that's in the rural schools? Okay, well, the rural schools I went to, the indigenous kids were 50% or more. Yes. Um, so there wasn't that sort of, um, yeah, they weren't a minority group, kind of. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, the ethos of the school was, you know, from day one, you're not a black kid or a white kid, you're just yeah. a kid from our school. And the, that's how the kids naturally are, with yeah. very few exceptions. Yeah, young ones have no concept that they are ones really Yeah. Um, it, it is interesting at, at the college though, where there's about 20 boys. Um, during the lunch hour and that sort of thing, they might congregate together, uh, but it, th and that's as far as it goes though, it, and it's a kind of just a convenient thing. There's a room for them. Um, throughout the rest of the time, I've spoken with plenty of the non indigenous boys. They just said, he's my mate just like any other mate. We, we don't even see colour. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the congregating, a very superficial thing at this high school. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they are, they are a minority, you know, 20 out of, you know, several hundred kids. Thank you for the talk. It really, uh, you know, very inspiring. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in possible differences in worldview. So, you mentioned that where there was a, a strong elder presence, yeah. or you know, you're really in a, in a situation where perhaps the Aboriginal kids are being brought up in a way that is reflective of quite traditional Aboriginal understandings of the world. Yeah. Do they experience any kind of conflict when they're brought into an educational system that's focused on Western understandings? Okay. Um... Well, in these schools, it's not exclusively focused on Western eyes, I understand. Thing. It is mostly, but no, generally there's no conflict um, between them and the, the rest of the school. Uh, in remote areas, what might be a bigger problem is you have different clans, and it could be a, a, an issue between them, and that could be because the parents had an issue the night before, and that's where on the school, it's good to have a an elder, an indigenous elder, who understands that sort of thing and can sort of work through the kid with it. But um, now, also coming to answer your question, uh, yes, you know, again, it'd be a lie to say that there's absolutely no difference. There are differences there; they're more minimal. They are more um, pronounced in remote settings, 
And one of the examples the principal gave me was you um, with the Indigenous kids, often their number system, they come from a family where their number system is a bit different. You got one, two, three, four, and a big mob, you know, kind of thing. And the teacher was telling me, the principal was telling me, it takes a little while to sort of get them through that sort of thing. Yeah. And he said, you heard the term NAPLAN before. Yeah. Um, he said, they have to do a bit of work sort of just normalising them so that um, when they do NAPLAN, they sort of um, not... Yeah. Have that so that's, so that's one example. That's a case when you, you're actually building on an understanding they already have, that like one, two, three, four, many years of yeah. work. And you can say, well, actually, we can extend the number system beyond yes. four. I'm thinking more of it, I mean, to just put it in a purely Western context for a, for a moment, if you had a child who was being brought up in, say, a fundamentalist religious family yeah. that didn't endorse the theory of evolution, but sure, yeah. a biblical view of the world, yeah. and they're in science class where they're being taught evolution, so there's going to be a, 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 a physiological mm -hmm. conflict for them. But you, you don't think that sort of thing really pertains? Or? Look, it may happen. I didn't have any teacher or student indicate it to me. Yeah. It indicate that happened. So yeah, it could, but it certainly wasn't apparent. What do you think would we'll close the gap? Um, a big gap. Yeah, it is. And I guess, I guess all the things we've spoken about, um, and I think at a national level, in Australia, the government are emphasising differences and seeing Indigenous people as a completely different species. So I think, take on board what I'm saying here, and in Australia we are starting to talk about it more, um, because as soon as you have an us-them mentality, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's like being in a three-legged race with someone, if you're sort of out of sync with them, it's, mm. it's really hard. Um, the other, so there's that sort of um, philosophical type thing, but on a more practical level, in Australia, uh, this is generalisation. A lot of the disadvantage with Indigenous people are those in remote, uh, rural and remote areas. If we look at remote areas, um, we have to ask some tough questions about those remote areas. Should government keep sustaining those remote communities where the parents aren't working, the kids just see parents get drunk and play cards, and therefore have no aspirations to go to school? Uh, and some really tough decisions have to be made. And no one wants to make the tough decisions. No politician wants to make a tough decision. And there are some really tough decisions. So, uh, you know, in just a short span of time, that's a quick off the cuff answer mm. for closing the gap. Um, and we know it can be done because there are, like I said, there are many successful, wealthy, healthy Indigenous people in Australia. Mm. Yeah, one. Just a, a, a small question about uh, how much in Australian curriculum um, you, you've got uh, education about uh, indigenous people. Yes. Um, so, how much white Australian know they know about indigenous people? Yeah. And in, uh, I mean, uh, is that a substantial part of, uh, of the curriculum? Or just uh, some a brief overview, and how adequate is the reality? It's it's becoming very it has become very substantial now, and in fact you will get some teachers who will say they've gone too far because there um, there's a movement trying to put an indigenous component into every subject. So when we learn about physics, we've got to try and relate it to indigenous, and that's just a bit fabricated. Is, no, I'm, I'm talking about um, about exactly how they perceive the world and uh, if all the rest of people, because uh, the, the history is taught, is yeah. always is both sides, so you need to understand yeah. to yeah, and that's important for both sides, yeah. not only because I think if you isolate these people and you don't know about anything about them. So that will be very difficult to close any gaps. Yeah, um, th there's been lots of positive things happen where Indigenous kids are so well catered to in schools and so welcome uh, in the schools that Indigenous culture is celebrated 
um, to the point where you've got plenty of Indigenous people learning about aspects of their culture they didn't know. Any other? Uh, Elizabeth, did you want to oh, just, um, make a comment? Oh, music to my ears to hear you talk. <laughs> because here in New Zealand, it's very much about emphasising the difference to the point where it's almost a racial ideology. The idea of, um, and, and in our schools, um, students are identified as Māori, whether or not they choose to identify or not that way. Some do, some don't. I know of some Māori youngsters who are, who, in fact, I had one say to me, it's racial profiling. Because of the colour of my skin, I am always referred to as Māori, and I'm asked to do the, um, do the mihi or whatever. And he's infuriated by it. In fact, he left um, the Faculty of Education, he was this particular one, he was training to be a teacher, and couldn't stand it any longer because every class he went into, the lecturer would, thinking she was doing the right thing, would identify him as, oh, you're Māori, where are you from? And would you? And he couldn't stand it. He said, if the colour of my skin was different, I would not be picked out this way. So he used the term racial profiling to me. Mm -hmm. um, and we've even got to the point where there's, there's now the idea of ways of knowing, indigenous ways of knowing um, in North America, red ways of knowing. In some African countries, African ways of knowing. And these are ideas promoted by um, a particular group of indigenous academics. Not all academics, but these are the ones on the circuit of court. Yeah, and that's Head Australia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got to be so respectful of the indigenous knowledges and, and yeah. ways, which, whatever that means. Yeah. They like what I said. <laughs>